Well, I am here with Spence Checkett, and I got to tell you a funny story, Spence. This is, uh, I've always kind of gravitated more to the national radio shows, the Colin Cowherd and Michael Wilbon are kind of the ones that I really enjoy. But about a, probably a decade or 12, 15 years ago, my brother came to me and he said, hey, there's actually a guy on the radio now that's really good, and uh, Spence Checkett. And so, started checking you out, and the thing that I love about you um, and your take and why I think your podcast has taken off how it has is you're very good at just giving the information from somebody that actually knows what they're talking about and you don't try to like play a side, right? right you right. talk the truth. And so one of the questions I have is like being as close to the team as you are, being as close to you know the NBA as you've always been, is it tough to give honest opinions knowing that you're going to run into these guys and see these guys and how do you dance around that a little bit? Well, the funny thing for me is I believe everything I say, you know, so I'm not a hot take guy. Um, at least I don't try to be. I'm not one of those guys that will come on air and, um, and say, you know, for instance, here locally, like Utah sucks, but BYU is awesome. Give me a call and tell me why. Kyle Winningham should have taken the BYU job. What do you think, you fans? Like, that's not me, right? And when it comes to the league, like, I've just been involved with it for so long on so many different levels, you know, working for teams being in war rooms during draft night, scouting games, talking to coaches, that I just, I just I see the league in a pretty, you know, pretty unique, um, I would say, experience way, which always allowed me to come on air and kind of help the listeners understand, like, no, I'm not telling you how to watch basketball, I'm just giving you um, pointers. So if you're sitting down to watch a game, maybe look for this, and maybe you wouldn't have thought about it um, that way unless you had listened to me. Um, but I think... My honesty on air and my, you know, being unafraid to say what I what I think, and also combine that with a lifetime of schooling of the league and the game, has more than anything led to respect from guys like Quinn Snyder and scouts around the league and the Jeff Van Gundys and and you know like Stan Van Gundy, um, Jeff and Stan are going to be broadcasting together tomorrow night at Staples. I'm actually trying to get them on the podcast simultaneously. Tom Thibodeau, I remember he was in town, and uh, Scott Layden, you know. Scott and Tom worked together in Minnesota, and Jeff had actually told Tom that I was on air. I knew Tom when he was an assistant with the Knicks, and Tom listened to a pre- and post-game show I was doing, and he called me later, and he said, that was spot on. You know, so I, it's one thing to have strong opinions, but it's another thing to have strong opinions that come from an educated standpoint, and I'm pretty confident in my ability to dissect, analyze both the game and the league, the business side and the game side, and then come strong with an opinion as opposed to just, and I can tell when people are on air just come, coming up with opinions that they think are awesome and strong and they haven't watched and they don't know. So I think it was kind of a good combination for me. Well, that's like as a fan, because I am I never really played basketball at a high level. I was a baseball guy. I did play football up till high school. So I understand the intrinsic parts of those sports. But when it comes to basketball, I mean, I have season tickets to the Jazz. Nice. I go to every game. But yeah. I can't tell you, I can't break down why Ricky Rubio's the guard that he is or you know if Derek Favors fits in with the team I have no idea I'm just out there watching and who hits the shots but when I listen to you I think it's the reason why I like you as as a sports personality is I actually feel smarter Mm -hmm. and even with Utah and BYU I always felt like you you didn't play either side you gave real opinions like sometimes BYU was doing the right and that's how I feel like I would want to be if I was a sports personality. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't want to be the BYU homer or the Utah homer, right? Right. I want to go and be able to call people out or be able to call it when it's good too, where people that are educated, I would play to the smarter audience because I don't care what the super fan thinks. He's going to hate me if I make one bad take. Mm -hmm. And so I I know like recently, you know, it's funny, you tweeted out about Ricky Rubio and like he had a really bad game the other day and you were like, look guys, like it is what it is, right? But it's like you also have those moments where you're, interviewing those guys and getting them on your podcast and things like that so it's just do you ever have players that hold that against you or is it they get it too and they can appreciate it as well as players even the only times i've had people in the league mad at me are if i the the times when i was able to uncover a story they didn't want me to have i'll I'll give you an example (laughs) i had a really good relationship with kevin o'connor still do um i haven't talked to him in a while he's not near as connected to the jazz as he used to be and that's why they hired Dennis as Kevin has phased out. Dennis has taken over and Dennis has done a remarkable job and Kevin was really good at what he, what he did as well. But I remember I got, I, I got a story on draft night a few years back and I had it from two different people and I tried to verify it with the Jazz while I was waiting for my second source that the Jazz were talking to the Cavs 
about sending Derek Favors in the number five pick in the draft in exchange for the number one pick. Now, people around here were pumped when they heard about it because they thought that that pick was going to be Jabari Parker. Mm. You know, and Jabari, a member of the LDS Church, a lot of people were pumped that he even considered BYU, even though I can tell you that he didn't. <laughs> yes. um, right, wrong, or indifferent. His father told my father, the, the um, connection there, that they thought BYU got in late. And so Jabari was high speed ahead to Duke, but a lot of people around here thought he was going to go to BYU nonetheless. The, but the target was Andrew Wiggins. It wasn't Jabari Parker. Mm-hmm. The Jazz really wanted Wiggins. And so I called Kevin. I called Dennis. And I said, hey, I got it from two people, including one person in Cleveland, who I think most of my listeners have figured out who I can get on the phone now. <laughs> um, and I said, look, I know it's not done, but I know you're talking. Can I, can I just get anything from you? And the Jazz are really tight-lipped. It's one of the reasons why they're really good. So I wasn't really expecting much. But when I went with it, I said, hey, look, the Jazz are having conversations about Derek Favors and the number five pick potentially exchange for the number one. I knew it was real. I wouldn't have gone with it if I didn't know it was real. Mm-hmm. And here's how you know it's real. Within five minutes, <laughs> my phone is blowing up and it's Kevin. It's Kevin O'Connor. <laughs> and I couldn't get it because I was on the air. But when I went to break, I went to call him back immediately. And Kevin was really mad at me, man. Like really, really mad at me because he was really protective of Derek. Mm-hmm. Because remember, Kevin's the one that made the trade to send Darren to the Nets mm. in exchange for a few pieces that including Derek, that included Derek Favors. Um, the only other time I've had a coach mad at me is um, I, I, caught, I caught the coach doing something wrong. And I'm not going to say who the coach was, but he coached for the Jazz and he no, no longer coaches for the Jazz <laughs> and it's not Jerry Sloan. So there Fair you enough. Go. Um, the Jazz were down three and they ran an inbounds play to get a two and there wasn't enough time to execute like the foul and like get the ball back. And on the post-game show, I remember this coach saying, well, we were only down two, so we needed a two. And I'm like, bro, you were down three, <laughs> you know? And I said that on air. Yeah. And so this coach called my boss, my boss pulled me in. And it's different because when you're working for a team, you do have to kind of coddle the coach a little bit. Right. But I stood by my guns. I'm like, well, he was wrong, and I was right, you know? But when it comes to just dissecting the league or dissecting a game, I've never really had a player or a coach that mad at me because mm-hmm. I think they respect the fact that I do my work. Well, and you can see how a GM would be particular. You see what happens now at the Anthony Davis Lakers situation, right? Mm-hmm. It's a total mess because it got out. The Lakers were trying to clean house of everybody. And right. so you kind of understand both sides of that. But I think that's one of the things with media today. And you've been around media for so long. And you've kind of seen the evolution of how the Internet has changed it. But there's so much media really is trying to get ratings they're trying mm-hmm. to get people to listen or watch and so they'll you know very much favor a side in a lot of situations and so i don't know i, I don't know how you feel about that as a sports personality more so than like you know maybe political mm-hmm. but i just feel like with it everything changing i think that you've talked about that's one of the reasons why you started the podcast you don't have to answer to anybody mm-hmm. you now have your own built-in audience and Speaking of the podcast, I want to get into that a little bit because having been podcasting now, we're on 130 you know episodes. One thing I love about your podcast, you've had Steve Young, John Starks, your dad, Dennis Lindsay, all these amazing people, and you have this way of getting them to tell stories where mm-hmm. I felt like I was sitting in on conversations that I shouldn't have been listening to. Right, right. Like you tell some stories that, you know, when the interview with your dad was amazing, I thought you talk about, and I want to kind of talk about that dynamic of growing up in that situation where your dad's the GM of the Jazz and the Knicks, but you talked about how like when they signed Patrick Ewing to mm-hmm. an extension that almost he was going to go to Golden State, all yeah. these different things. To have that access now is the reason why I think your podcast is so intriguing to listen to, but is that something that being on the radio for so long, you've learned how to draw those stories out, and how does that help you just having those personal relationships? I think it's the way I've always been. I think it's just my personality. That's why when I got into media for the first time, it felt right. It was like trying on a new pair of pants mm-hmm. where you're like, yes, I'm going to love these pants. You know, they fit really well. You know, putting on a new hat that's broken in the right way. It just felt right. You know, like I knew I could do this. And I've always been a conversationalist. And I've always been really genuinely interested in other people's stories. Not, not in a fake way. You mm-hmm. know, not faux interested. Like genuinely interested. I want to know, like when I had Steve Young on, I wanted to know what it was like for him to back up Jim McMahon and then back up Joe Montana. And what was that relationship like? And when people realize that you're genuinely interested in them as opposed to, well, let's get a good story for ratings. Mm. They're more apt to open up a little bit. Like, I think Steve genuinely thought I was just going to ask him about the Super Bowl. You know, I'd be like, is Brady the greatest? Or, you know, what was your take on, 
the NFC Championship game or whatever. And questions that Steve probably gets every single week where he's like, oh, yawn or whatever. When Steve realized I wanted to talk about him, because my main goal for this, you know, we're going to talk a lot about the NBA because that's kind of my built-in brand. And it's the league I know. It's it's the league I love. And when you leave here, I'll fire up my TV and watch games tonight, you know, and and follow the storylines. But attendant to that is I want this to be a long-form conversation piece with fascinating people in and around the world of sports. But I'm not opposed to talking to anybody. That's why right. when I was looking at your guest list, I'm like, man, that's cool. Like, you'll talk to whoever, which, yeah. I, which I dig. Um, but I, I'm sure it's a combination of being in media 15 years in, in, in live radio. And when you're in live radio, it's different. Like, that light goes on and you better be on. You can't stop the <laughs> camera or the mic and then start editing. Like, you got to go. Um, and a combination of that, then also just kind of my personality. Like, I'm genuinely interested in hearing people's stories because... Yeah. When, when you have a genuine interest and people will open up, you learn. Like Steve Young had separation anxiety to the point where he didn't want to leave his house. He was the NFL MVP. Fascinating part of the interview. And when you hear that, you're like, okay, well, maybe I can do something with my anxiety. Hmm. You know, or maybe maybe I'll call my brother who struggles with depression and say, you got to fire up this interview. Listen to what Steve Young had to say. Yeah, I think that's that to me was the part of the interview, the Steve Young interview particularly, where I started listening and I thought, wow, like I need to learn how to pull those things out of people because sometimes your guests will open up to you mm-hmm. and that's amazing, right? right? And then other times I've learned as a podcast interviewer, I'm like, man, I am not getting what I want here. And it's I know it's me not being able to make that connection where they fully feel like they can open up. Um, I mean, you your history is so fascinating to me because when I was a little kid, my goal was to one day have ticket, a ticket in the lower bowl. <laughs> that wow. was, and you were running around in the locker rooms, I'm sure. You yeah. literally from, I don't know what age, when your dad took the GM job with the Jazz. With the, you know, I mean, how old were you at that time? So I would have been, let's see, five. I was five, five years old. Five years old. Yeah. So, I mean, literally, it was so normal for you to be around the NBA and be around these players. Yeah. What was that like as a kid? Did you understand how special that was in that moment? It's a good question because, no, there's no way of knowing because that's normal for you. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's, no, um, there's no comparison to a different life because that's your life. Um, and even before we moved to Salt Lake, when my father took the job with the Jazz, we were in Boston and my dad was with Bain and Company. And his, one of the first projects that he was overseeing at Bain was to do a complete overview and analysis of the Boston Celtics to see whether or not it made sense for Bain to buy the Celtics. Danny Ainge was playing for the Celtics at the time. Mm-hmm. And with the LDS connection and my father being a BYU guy and Danny being a BYU guy, we became friends with the Ainges. So when I was three or four, my first NBA experiences were at the Boston Garden. So even before the Salt Palace, that's a throwback for a lot of people <laughs> that, that may not know, even before the Salt Palace and the old school Utah Jazz, I was going to see Celtic games in the old Boston Garden. Mm. So I have no memories that don't that are not attached somewhat to NBA basketball. So no, I didn't know what a unique situation it was. It was just life for me. And it, lucky for me, I, not only was it cool, I, I, I also loved the, the game. Right. You know, I just, I started playing when I was younger. I had a Nerf hoop, I loved my Nerf hoop. You know, and I was, uh, when I was young, I would wear a Larry Bird jersey. And then when we came out here to Salt Lake, I wore a John Stockton jersey or like sweats or warm-ups literally every day to school. When I come home, I'd shoot, you know, go shoot on the on the hoop. And if I got my homework done, we could go to the jazz game later on. And my sister and I would go get nachos in the, you know, in 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 the um, VIP the, room. Yeah, the VIP room. We get our popcorn. I had a program. I would keep score, like two for a bucket. And I remember I'd be so pumped if like Daryl Griffith had three, I could write a three by it, you know. <laughs> And it also helped me learn the game because I used to chart rebounds and assists and blocks and steals. You know, now we have everything on our phone and we look at a box score or we get it, you know, end of the quarter. I used to keep track in the program wow. you know, when I was young. Yeah, so, I remember getting the next morning you had to go to the paper. Right, right That's right. where you would read yeah. that or whatever. So when you were a little kid, I mean, were the players receptive to you? Were you the little kid running around? Were they cool? Was the players... Nice, I guess, as a, as a little kid. You know, my dad was really good to help us understand, like, where the boundaries were. It's not like mm-hmm. I was, you know, five years old running around the locker room and Carl Malone was Still changing their my shoes diaper or, whatever, or something, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> not running, taking a shower with Bart Kofed <laughs> and Bobby Hansen. You know, like, we were taught, like, okay, locker room, this is, dad's, dad's got to work, so just stand over here, you know, and, and, um, and there were times where, like, for instance, here, here's, here's a funny story that not a lot of people know. Um, 
1984. So the Jazz Draft Carl, okay? Mm. Um, and um, we went to the airport to pick him up. It was just my dad and I. And Larry Miller had provided a brand new truck for Carl. It was a big, beautiful black truck. My dad was driving. I'm in the back seat. We pick up Carl. And, um, and we're driving Carl around. And I can remember, even as a really young kid, them talking about Carl's first contract. Mm -hmm. I remember Carl saying something like four years and my dad said something like three like I was too young to understand like what <laughs> this you know. is crazy this is like the very beginning of the Utah Jazz yeah I mean, before that they were literally being outdrawn by the hockey team in town the right. AAA the hockey Golden team Eagles. right yep. so I mean you were literally were there for the when Carl Malone arrives to Utah for the first time jazz games were on tape delay to make room for BYU basketball wow KSL would tape a jazz game then they'd carry BYU hoops live and then the jazz game would be after that so think about that for a second but I don't remember specifics. I just remember being in the back seat and hearing them talking about four years, three years, like. And then later on in my life, I'm like, I was there for like the first Carl Malone contract negotiation. Yeah. But the next day, we went to the circus, and this is when we were going to introduce Carl, like the newest jazz man. Mm -hmm. at, the circus was at the Salt Palace, and I was sitting on Carl's lap, and I leaned forward and hit my mouth on the rail and I lost my first tooth on Carl Malone's lap. How crazy is that? That's awesome. And I remember they introduced Carl and he stood up and he's waving and I'm covering my mouth. I got blood and I lost my tooth. <laughs> so like, again, I didn't understand how unique that was because that was just my life. You don't have perspective when you're five or six. That's right. just, it's just your life. You know? So when your dad he ends up getting the job with, well, I think a job with the NBA, but then he ends up with the Knicks, yeah. right? President mm -hmm. of the Knicks. Um, did you switch your loyalties from the jazz to the Knicks mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. And how old were you when your dad ends up moving out there? So we were, I, I was 11 when we moved out. Um, and it was a heartbreaking move, man. I was devastated because I love the jazz. Um, I learned to really love Frank. Uh, Jerry had taken over. Car, you know, John was my hero. I, I still, John Stockton is like my basketball demigod, you know. Um, and we lived um, up in the avenues uh, close to the University of Utah and I had such a fun great group of friends and we were getting ready for middle school and and so I was devastated when we moved um, and it took a little while for me to acclimate I ended up really loving it back east the majority of my family is still back there and I mm -hmm. still get back there when I can um, but you learn to change loyalties when the the very um, existence of your family is predicated on the outcome of a, of a game that is tied to a team. So it's not like I really had a choice. And then we started going to the garden. Mm. And that's when I went, I have no problem changing loyalties because it's such an incredible building. It's such an incredible atmosphere. So I went begrudgingly from a jazz fan to a Knicks fan. My first year back east, I still wore my Stockton sweats. Oh, wow. My first day at school, I had a jazz bag, a Stockton sweats, and I'm sure all the kids were like, what is this dude all about, <laughs> you know? But then he started going to the garden, then the Knicks got good and everything yeah. changed. Well, it's funny because anybody, you know, the last 15 years, the Knicks have been terrible. 20, uh, yeah. The last 20 years, they've yeah. I mean, they've really minutes. been really bad ever since Van, G Van Gundy left. Yep. And it's kind of funny because I still remember those Knicks teams were really good too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Patrick Ewing and John Starks and all those guys and um, always competing with the Bulls and the Pacers and those times. But um, you hear people say now the Garden is like the most special place, but I don't really, you don't get it because I never want to watch a Knicks game. Like sure, there's sure. no reason I would ever turn on a Knicks game in the last 15 years. And so what is it about the Garden that made it so much special? Because I just saw the way you reacted to that. Yeah. What, what was it about the Garden? Well, I, I mean, first of all, just going into the city, okay? New York has an energy, and it's a little cliche at this point. And I'm sure people out here who have not experience, experienced it probably roll their eyes a little bit. New York, the city has an energy about it that's just, it's, it, is, it cannot be duplicated. Yeah. And I've been to every major city in this country and a lot of major cities overseas. In New York, there's something special about it. So you, you have the energy of the entire city. You know, the Madison Square Garden billboard, you know, right there on, on 33rd and 7th and you're walking up and it's just like this incredible experience. And then you walk in and the history and it's not just hoops, right? Like it's the Rangers, it's concerts, mm -hmm. it's boxing matches, like some of the biggest events in the history of the world have been at Madison Square Garden, right. not just basketball. And you can't recreate that sort of air, you know, you can't re recreate that sort of um, it just kind of surrounding the way it feels when you walk in the building and you walk down the hall and you see the pictures of Muhammad Ali and John Lennon and, 
you know, then, then you get into Walt Frazier and Willis Reed and Mark Messier and just everything that's gone on. Um, it, it's just, it, it's just an experience unlike anything else. And the building, it, it just underwent a, a renovation for a while. It was a little bit aged, but when they redid it, it, it just, the, the lighting is, is, is all in the court. Like for instance, with, um, the Lakers do that. The Lakers do that, yeah. but the Knicks were the first to do it. Okay. So, and this is kind of a subtle thing, but if you go to a jazz game, if you go to a Vivint Smart Home, you can look up to the 50th row and see your boy. Right. And you're like, hey, what's up? Okay. If you're at a garden and you're on the uh, and you're you're on a court, you can't look up and see your your guy because it's dark up there. Like the lighting's on the court, the way they have everything formulated, and then just the history of the building, and then the fact that it's just in the middle of New York City, which a lot of people believe is still to this day, even though the Knicks have been a joke for so long just the Mecca of basketball, right. it, it, it's hard to describe what it was like really growing up going to games in that building. And that's when I went from, man, I really love this game to like, I want to do this forever. Well, and you were so bought into basketball at even a young age. Did you ever try to influence your dad on what you guys were, what he was doing with the team? Um, Did you have your guys that maybe you wanted to hang on to or try to tell him to go yeah, trade? Like, I mean, obviously he was probably never going to listen to you, sure. but... You know, I can imagine if my dad was the president of the Knicks and I was a big Knicks fan, I'd be like, Dad, we got to go get this guy. <laughs> no, I always, from when I was like eight months old, I was, I was like this, man. <laughs> like, gift to gab. You know, like, yeah. even in, when, I, when I was playing, like in my own career, I'm always talking to the other team, talking to the ref, which didn't do me any favors. You know, I was just always yapping away. So I'm sure I would <laughs> offer up opinions. Um, like, for instance, when the, when the Knicks traded Oakley for Camby, Marcus, or, mm. yeah, Charles Oakley for Marcus Camby, I was so bummed out, man, because Oak was my guy. And then they traded Starks for Sprewell. Mm. So bummed out, you know. Now, both deals turned out to be fantastic. Yeah. Ewing gets hurt. Camby steps in. They go to the finals in 99. Spree had a five-year run in the Garden that made everybody forget that he choked P.J. Carlissimo because he was just that <laughs> it special. It was after that, right? Yeah, but yeah, Starks, yeah. <laughs> it was actually, it was before that. That's what made the trade so... So I meant like he, after that's when he yes, played for the Knicks. Yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah, that's what I meant. But Starks and Oak, you know, I love them so much. And then when they traded Mason for LJ, mm -hmm. Anthony Mason for LJ, which again, ultimately turned out to be a great deal, but Mason was my guy. Like, I was bummed out, but it's not like my dad would say... Hey, hold on. Don't make that deal. My 16-year-old uh, son says he loves Anthony Mason. You yeah. know what I mean? So. I just can imagine being both a fan, but then also being the son of the guy that's literally making the moves for the team. It's right. just such a unique dynamic. Well, so you end up, at what at what point did you go, okay, I mean, did you, you had your own basketball career. You played. Ish. Um, but you played in high school, right? Yeah. And um, I, um, I I was recruited pretty heavily by, by a lot of colleges. Um, Including BYU, those out here, right? Yeah. BYU wanted me to sign as a sophomore. Okay. Um, but I, I don't know that I could have done the Provo thing. I came out for a recruiting trip, and Roger Reed was great to me, and Lance Archibald. They're, my recruiting trip, it was me, Nate Cooper, who ultimately went to BYU, right. and Chris Burgess. Oh, man, you were on that recruiting yeah, trip. Yeah, you remember what went down. And I didn't know. Th like, this is before the internet, right? And so I didn't know who Chris Burgess was. So for those that aren't familiar, he was the number one recruit in the nation, Mormon kid. Kind of the first time it was like a huge recruit right. for BYU, right. number one guy, super Mormon guy too. So it was like yeah. he fit the profile yeah. and ultimately went to Duke. I think there was like a huge controversy because right. Roger Reed said he went, he let down the whole Mormon church. Right? It cost Roger his job, it, which yeah. was unfortunate for me because I really liked Roger. I really liked his sons. I went to BYU basketball camp and Darren, his son, was a was one of my roommates. Mm. And so, like, I knew Randy and Robbie were playing there, but I didn't know what Burge was about, right? So I show up, and Burgess was a beast. I mean, he was making BYU's bigs look silly. He was dunking on people, and I'm like, man, this kid is serious. And then a week later, I read in the paper, you know, he's going to Duke, and Roger said what he said, and ultimately it cost him So I job. think BYU fans will be interested to hear, like, what did you guys do on the recruiting trip? Did it, was, did it seem like it went well, or were there signs on that recruiting trip that he was leaning Duke? Well, I mean, th there are different levels, right? Like Burgess was probably out there for a week. I was only out there for a couple of days. Got it. And it was it was fun. I mean, you know, we stayed close to campus. We got up, we'd scrimmage. Um, you know, we'd play with the BYU players that were there. Like, you know, Randy. Randy was a really, 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 good, really, good. really yeah, good player. Yeah. A lot of people forget. Like Randy and Robbie. Yeah, yeah. Robbie was probably a better college player, but Randy was such an incredible high school player. But anyway. Yeah. And then we'd go to like, um, we went to Wendy's. But I remember Coach Archibald was like, "You guys gotta, you gotta pay for your own, uh -huh. you know, drinks. If you want a burger, you gotta pay for it." Like they couldn't do anything for us. We toured the campus, and then one night we went to like a, a house party, as a, a BYU house party. You know, yeah. walked around and met some people, and 
And then I went back east. So, but I mean, it was fun. I enjoyed it. And I almost, I, you know, I, I came pretty close to doing it. But so to so, say I had a basketball career, okay. I was a good high school basketball player. I was a McDonald's All-American candidate. Um, I was All-State a couple of times. Um, but, you know, to spend very much time talking about my basketball career is a little bit silly. <laughs> it ended at the University of Utah. Okay. And ultimately, you end up finishing your career. At what point did you go, okay, now I really want to just make a career? Because you actually went into, I mean, you were a scout and some yeah. different things like that as well. Did you do that first or did you go into the radio side first? I, I scouted first. So okay. when, um, and Rick Majerus, rest his soul, um, I went up there with the intent of playing at the University of Utah and Andre Miller was also a freshman. Mm. And with, look, here, here's a lesson for, for all you young basketball players out there or baseball or football or whatever. If you think you're really good at a sport, play against somebody who's going to play professionally for years you find out real quick, like, and I remember thinking, like, you know, I'm pretty good at this, but there's no way I'm close to that. Like, playing against a guy like Andre, and then five-star basketball camp, like God Sham God, Tim Thomas, Jerry Stackhouse, guys mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. That's when I went from, well, oh, I'm, like, one of the best high school players around to, like, holy smokes, I can't do any of that. Well, they joke that the Olympics, to really do it justice, to show how good everyone is, they should have a random Joe in the pool lane, for example, you got these eight swimmers that are all the best in the world. They should throw a random guy in the pool so you can actually see just how good right. the Olympians are. Because you watch it and you're like, oh, that guy sucks. You know, he took seventh place or whatever. Right, right. But when you actually play against, I remember in baseball, it was like the best kid I ever played against was not good enough to make the major leagues. Sure, you start sure. to put in that, that into perspective. It's one of the reasons I sit right by the visitor's tunnel in my season tickets for the Jazz game. Mm -hmm. And people are always like, oh, do you talk trash to the players? I said, no, I don't. Because I have so much respect for who they are and the right. player they are that I don't ever want to be that guy that's trying to like bring them down because I was terrible at basketball. I wasn't good enough to play high school. So it's like for me to talk trash to these guys that are the best in the world at what they do, I just I have no desire to do that. Right. No, I, I remember thinking, like, I could play with pretty much anybody. At that age, when you're 16, 17, sure. averaging 20, 25 a game for your high school, like, I could play with anybody. And then I go to these camps. I remember the first time I played against God Sham God. Sham God Wells, played at Providence, played in the league for a mm -hmm. while. I couldn't get the ball past half court. He picked me three straight times. And I was so embarrassed. I asked my coach, I'm like, I'm out. I can't do it. Pulled this me. dude was so much bigger and stronger than I was. And he was a point guard. Mm. And it's not like he was the number one recruit in the nation. Sham God was probably top 50, went to you know PC and, and was a friar and then played overseas. But that was the first time. I remember I came home from camp and my dad's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I'm not playing in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think something about you is, is just overall, I feel like you kind of grew up pretty fast. From the time sure. you're three years old, you're in NBA locker rooms. And I mean, you got married young. Mm -hmm. You have a 17 year old now, right? You have a senior in high school. Um, and then you, uh, you know, you end up getting married and divorced. Um, I know you had uh, cancer. Yep. Um, walk us through a little bit, kind of that portion of your life. You had a lot of challenges, a lot of things come at you. Um, how did having a dad that was so well recognized and how did having your life where you grew up, you know, around so many people of stature, I'll say, help you get through that? And what were the maybe some of the disadvantages of being in the spotlight during some of those challenges? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I met a girl who I adored when I was at the University of Utah and we got married. I became a really young husband. I came, became a really young father. Um, I worked for the Olympics here in 2002. I was one of the venue managers for the Salt Lake Ice Center. That was my first job, first real job out of college. And then we moved back east, and um, I was working for a record label back there. I got in the music industry, believe it or not. As a musician? Or? No, no, no. Although I enjoy playing music, I'm not on a level where anybody should look to sign, <laughs> should look to sign me. I can play some Dave Matthews covers. That's about it That's on the guitar. That's good enough for a karaoke um, night, right? Yeah, if you want some Jack Johnson, I'll <laughs> fire up the guitar. Um, but, no, I... Almost equal passion, almost an equal passion of mine to basketball is music. I've always loved music, and so I wanted to kind of see what that industry was about. And so I've been working for a label called Valor Records back there. Um, Soul Live is probably our biggest act. They're huge over, and you can Google it. I mean, they played like the MLS All Star Game a few years ago. Like, they're not a massive success, but they're kind of our baby, our story, and they're massive overseas. We, you know, we sent them on to a larger level. Own Trio. I mean, some other acts we we worked with. Um, but it was challenging to be a young husband and a young father to be in that industry. I was gone on, on weekends a lot and, and uh, at night a lot. Um, so that was, that was challenging for, for my marriage and, 
And ultimately what, what ended up happening, to make a really long story short, um, I was shooting baskets at my parents' home with my little brothers. And I came down after just shooting like a little jump shot, I came down and I violently sprained my left ankle. Like it, it bent over to the point where it felt like somebody stepped on it, Oh man! but nobody was around me. It was really strange. And I remember thinking right then, I'm like, that's weird. Okay, like I'm not 16 anymore, but I'm 25. Like yeah. I'm not old, like that's weird. Why, why is my ankle like crumbling like that? Um, two weeks later, I put my left hand on the steering wheel of my car, I couldn't turn it left. I was in the shower, I was trying to floss my teeth, I couldn't floss my teeth. I took a step out of the shower, I collapsed, I fell down. When I was getting dressed, I tried to tie my shoe, I couldn't tie my shoe, and I'm like, what in the world is this? In your head, I don't know, have you ever been sick before? Uh, not like that, no. Knock on wood. Yeah. So in your head, when there's something wrong with you, you know it, but you deflect mm -hmm. and you justify. So in my head, I'm like, man, I must have really sprained my ankle really badly which makes no sense. Like an ankle sprain, suddenly you can't tie your shoe or fly. like, there was something up, but I completely pushed it out of my mind. Um, fast forward another week and my family was set to fly out to Salt Lake to see my grandfather win a Father of the Year award. And I had to stay back for work. But the day before the flight, it was to the point where I could barely even walk. And I'm like, I can't be left alone. So I went to my I went to my wife at the time and my mom and I said, look, I need to get on this flight with you. I need to come out to Salt Lake with you. I can't be left alone. And they're like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm all right. But in my mind, I'm like, no, man, I'm not. Yeah. On the flight, I collapse on the plane. My brothers have to help me up. We get off the plane. My grandpa's there waiting to pick us up. And um, he looks at me, he's like, you've had a stroke because the left side of my face was drooping a little bit. Mm. I'm like, no, I don't think it's a stroke. I had no chest pain, didn't pass out, didn't ring true. Um, so that night, my mom comes in our bedroom, it's like 2 a.m., and she said, look, I know what's up. Um, I, th or I think I know what's up. We need to get you down to Lakeview. We were in Bountiful, Lakeview Hospital. We need to get you a brain MRI. I think this is neurological. And something clicked. I'm like, oh, man, she's probably right. Like that made, It was the first thing I heard that made sense. So we went down, had the MRI. Um, Jan Freeman, a doctor in Bountiful, is the one who followed it up. Good family friend. He has, unfortunately, since passed, ironically enough, from a brain tumor. Hmm. Jan followed it up and at this point I'm in a wheelchair I couldn't even walk and um, he comes in the waiting room it's just me and my mom and I said how does it look and he said you know there's no easy way to say this he said you have a gigantic brain mass you're a, a, gig a gigantic mass sitting on the right side of your brain on your motor strip which is why your left side is being affected and I'm like brain mass I'm like do you mean a brain tumor and he said yeah it's a brain tumor and what I said to him, I said, is it cancerous? Not knowing, like, you got to figure this, yeah. figure this out. I'm like, well, is it cancerous? He's like, oh, I don't, I'm not sure. I said, well, am I going to die? And he said, yeah, you might. And I said, I have a son. It was the only thing I could think of saying, because Connor was two. My, my son was two at the time. I said, I have a son. I can't die. It's not an option, you know? So they put me in an ambulance, take me up to University of Utah Hospital, Huntsman. And... We're, our hair is on fire as a family now. It's like, what do we do here? Um, initially, the, the prognosis was they couldn't operate, which means I'm dead in a couple weeks. Yeah, they give you a couple weeks to live originally. Right? Initially, because it's like, look, this is growing so quickly. That's why a sprained ankle turns into can't move, can't, you know, can't even walk. Um, and so, and I didn't know any of this. I'm in a, I'm in a hospital room just kind of insulated, you know. And, but they're telling my parents we can't operate on it. And so they told my mom, if anybody wants to say goodbye to Spencer, have them come in. And so suddenly I'm in, I'm in, the, I'm in a hospital room and suddenly my hotel, or excuse me, not a hotel, my hospital room is inundated with family, friends, uh, college friends, like friends from my youth, like all my cousins, all my aunts and uncles. And I'm, I'm like, this is a goodbye. Did you understand in that moment what it probably meant? Well, nobody said anything to me because right. no one's going to walk in and be like, hey, dude, they can't operate, so <laughs> right. good luck. But everyone came in, and you could see the fear in their eyes. And I'm like, this is bad. This is a goodbye. Um, so then Bill Caldwell, who's the head of um, neurosurgery up at Huntsman, who's my hero, he flew in town because he was out of town. He flew in town. Um, my parents were able to get a hold of him and say, we need you to come follow this up because at this point, nobody thinks they can operate on it. Bill Caldwell comes into town follows up the MRI and says, look, it's tricky, but we're going to try. We're going to try and operate on it. And by God's graces, in my angel on earth, Bill Caldwell, 12-hour surgery, they were able to take it out. 
um, eight hours of radi- or eight weeks of radiation after that. They told me I would never walk again. If I did, I'd need a cane or a walker. Um, I was able to, again, by the grace of God, you know, have a pretty normal life after that. I can't jump or like ski, like balance is still kind of tricky for me um, the way I used to. Um, but, you know, after um, a few weeks in the hospital and then physical therapy, they discharged me. And of course, I still had to go back for checkups. Um, but again, I was blessed to, to be able to survive that. My marriage did not survive that. Um, about six weeks after I was out of the hospital, that's when my wife came and said, you know, she, she wanted to move on. Wow. Was it just too much for her to handle? Or was yeah. There... Yeah. You know, I think it was. And um, I don't, I look back and she was a kid, man. Like we were both so young. Mm-hmm. Um, she was a mom like a, a year out of high school, a wife a year out of, like she was so young. And so was I. And we just did the best we could. And we moved across country so I could take a job with a record label. And that's something you should do if you're not married and no kids. <laughs> yeah, and sure. like, there's no pressure on you to provide. And um, I think that was hard on her to be away from her family. Mm. And then I remember looking at her. In, I, I was in the hospital and I was laying, laying there. And this was after the doctors had said, it looks, looks good. Like, you're going to survive. I remember looking at her and like, she's tired. Like, she looks exhausted. Connor's too... Um, she doesn't know what's going to happen with her husband. Like, what's up? You know, she has no idea. And I remember in that moment, I never said this to her, but I remember in that moment thinking, like, I don't know if this is going to work. Mm-hmm. Like, and I read Lance Armstrong's book. It's not about the bike. Mm-hmm. Well, and I know I've we're supposed it. to hate Lance Armstrong. Now. No, there's a lot to still it's admire. It's an there. awesome yeah. book. Okay. Agreed. And I read it when I was sick and it was really inspirational. And his marriage didn't last as a result of his illness. And I remember thinking like, and he said the same thing. He's like, she was just tired. I remember thinking like Cassie, and she is a wonderful mother and a beautiful person. Like I love her to this day. Remarried to a great guy. They have three kids together. Um, But I remember thinking like, she's tired and this may not work. And ultimately it didn't. Six weeks later, she... She uh, decided that she wanted to move on. So how did how do you cope with so much of life coming at you at one time? I mean, you literally there's of the top three or four most stressful things that somebody can go through in life. I mean, you're knocking one and two right next to like probably a child dying right, right that can come at you. I mean, was and you're young, you know. How did you react? How did I mean? What happens? What did, walk us through the next little phase? How you get through that and kind of where you went next. Well, sadly, I reacted horribly. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not justifying any action. You know, I want to be clear. I think, I think you would be able to. And one of the things that Tony Robbins always says, I love this. He says, we deal with the information we have at the time. Sure. Right. Sure, so yeah. it's like you're until you've been in that position. I don't think anybody can put themselves in your shoes. Like right, You can right. try to pretend that you know what that's like. But until you've been. I mean, where you think you're dead and then your marriage is, you know what I mean? So just, I like to preface it with that, that like, I think the power of your story is where you are today, mm-hmm. 2019, right. you know? And I don't think, I think the path is, it's the reason I want to have you on the podcast is there's so much that you, I mean, you just had such an interesting life. Right, to me, right. you've had one of the most fascinating lives of any human. And so I'm very interested in hearing kind of some of those ups and downs that happen to somebody in those stages. Cause I think anybody listening, everyone has things they go through. So to hear your story and how much you were dealing with at one time, uh, I think there's a lot of power in that. Sure. Sure. Um, it's like the, um, Jacques Cousteau quote at the end of Rushmore, that great Wes Anderson movie. It's then it's something I'm going to butcher, it, but it's something like anyone who has the opportunity to lead an extraordinary life has no right to keep it to himself, <laughs> you know? So at times I'm, I'm hesitant to share certain things, but ultimately if there's a lesson to be learned from all of this, and that's kind of like my main motivation for living now, just like hoping I can help people, hoping somebody hears a story like this and go, okay, I can do this, you know, like whatever it is. But, um, back to the original point, like I responded horribly. Um, my wife at the time said that she wanted to move back home with her parents in Bountiful, her mother and stepfather in Bountiful. And I was ne- never, at no point did I consider like moving away from my son or being away from my son or even entertain the idea of getting my son away from her. Like, mm-hmm. no, no, no. Like, if this is where she's going to be, that's where my son is going to be. And so that's where I'm going to be. So I flew back east. I rented a U-Haul and I packed up everything we had. You know, my head shaved. Like, I have this <laughs> big old, and you can't really see it, but I have this big old scar in my head that starts here, goes all the way here, and then goes right, like... Wow. It is a massive, massive scar. Um, and like 
luckily my hair kind of came back so you can't really see it but at the time I'm completely bald and so I'm wearing you know my beanies and my hats and and I'm driving cross country with everything we own and just a few weeks prior I'd been in the hospital you know and in like a week prior to that I was told that you know my wife didn't want to be married anymore so I rent a one-bedroom apartment downtown close to where we're at now at Gateway at the time and um, that's when I for the first time in my life discovered that alcohol isn't just something that socially you can do with friends or have a beer watching a game. You can use it to turn your feelings and your mind off. Mm. Okay. And that's a dangerous, dangerous, slippery slope. And it's a horrifying realization because it's one thing like you hear the term social drinker, right? Somebody will go out and have a glass of wine with dinner or if they want to have a beer with their buddies or whatever, a couple, couple of pops or whatever, like you're not turning your mind off. You're enjoying a social occasion. The scary thing about alcohol is if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're worried, if you're stressed, if you're angry, whatever, this turns it all off. Mm. And that was the first time. I, I mean, I had drank before. I, when I first started drinking in high school and then in college. Sure, you know, but I, you hadn't drank to deal with depression. I hadn't drank to deal with emotion before. Right. I just drank because I was having fun with friends and it never caused a problem in my life. But when I discovered, wait a second. I don't have to think about being sick. I don't have to think about being divorced. I don't have to think about anything. All I have to do is this. And I just run down to the liquor store and get some whiskey. And, and at night, you know, when no one's around, I can drown my sorrows. Like, this is a miracle. What you don't realize is if that's the agreement you make with yourself, that that's the path you want to follow, it quickly goes from here, okay, this works, to, oh, my gosh, my life is in shambles. Hmm. And next thing I know, I'm living entirely unconsciously. I'm making horribly unconscious irresponsible selfish decisions and I found myself in a world of hurt um, and again I'm not blaming it on anything right I'm just outlining the no, I don't think it's it's not an excuse but it is a reason right, right I mean right. I think yeah. that's the ultimate what you're trying to say yeah now I mean so to answer your question I responded to it irresponsibly but I found something that could turn it all off in an instant hmm. and that's the cruel trick of drugs and alcohol. That's the dancing with the devil dynamic of drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol work, mm. but only for about this long. And then suddenly you don't know which way is up and which way is down. Wow. And so having gone through that, right, um, and again, being a public figure, mm-hmm. unfortunately, um, you ended up last year, a year ago today, mm-hmm. you ended up um, getting pulled over and got a DUI yep. and lost your job at the Jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to kind of just talk about, because you ended up going to a rehab center, is mm-hmm. that correct? Yeah. Tell us a little bit of kind of just ultimately how you came through that. And because today you're, you're doing really well and yeah. it's really fun to watch. And I'm honestly, you have so many fans. I think you're a polarizing person because mm-hmm. some people just don't want to hear the bad news about their team and things like that. But for those of us that enjoyed listening to you, we're very excited to have your podcast and have you out there, right? Sharing your knowledge again, because you have such a unique ability to do that. And so talk to us a little bit about kind of what that did for you going and, and how you said it saved your life to have sure. that experience mm-hmm. one year ago today. What do you mean by that? And kind of what's, what's been the past since then? Well, I mean, it was, it's hard to really even wrap my mind around because I, um, you know, after the period you and I are discussing right now, after my, um, battle with my brain tumor and my divorce, I ran into real trouble with, with the alcohol abuse. You know, mm-hmm. I was arrested a couple of times, um, you know, and I went through rehab before and, at the age of 27, 28, I'm thinking, okay, you learn your lesson, you know, leave that all behind. And when I did, and when I got sober, and when I found recovery, I started to fly. That's when I got, that's when I had the afternoon drive show with Bill Riley mm-hmm. on um, ESPN 700, Bill and Spence, and it was a really fun show. That's when I learned to love radio. Um, and then from there, after about five years with Riles, that's when I got the gig with the jazz and the big show. Uh, you know, initially it was Scott Gerard and I afternoon drive, and that lasted a few months because of the merger between K Fan and and 1280, and that's mm-hmm. when Gordon and I were, were thrown together, and that's where the big show was born, and and we had a really special show, like a really fun show. Yeah, it was by far and away the best show in Utah. I, I mean, it's, it's not even Thank close. You. Like it was the only one that I would put on at that time. And I appreciate it because yeah. a lot of people will say like, "Oh man," um, I remember a question I got quite a bit was, um, "Did your drinking affect your work?" And I can honestly sit here and tell you it didn't. I worked my tail off of that show every day. I think if people have never drank, they don't understand that like it's not 
in the moment of your work, you're not. It's not like you're taking whiskey and going and hitting the job. It's, right, right. You know, and, and it's it is a t- like once you're no longer under the influence for that day, it's yeah. you function fully as a person in that. Right. Way. But I took that responsibility very seriously. Yeah. I knew that that was a special slot. I knew it was a special show. I really loved Gordon, and then pre F and post with Britain. Um, you know, I took that seriously. Like my drinking didn't affect my work. Right. My personal life was in shambles. I mean, you know, it really was. But, you know, I was able to put together a good amount of sobriety and really learn to love radio and love my job. And then I started to fly. And that's what makes a year ago today so puzzling, you know, because um, everything on on the outside looking in, the appearance was I had it all. I had a great job, had a lovely home, you know, a nice car, all that stuff. But in reality, underneath the surface, I was unconscious again. I was miserable. Mm-hmm. Um, for the first time in my life, I was in a relationship and I, I allowed things to be done to me where I stopped taking care of myself. And so I started numbing to the point where I just started living completely unconsciously because I didn't want to deal with what I had done to my life by allowing this dynamic to take place in my life. I mean, we've all had dysfunctional relationships. This was a new level for me. <laughs> Like it truly was, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I can imagine. And instead of, and I, and here's the funny thing, Jimmy, like follow your gut, man. Like follow your intuition. Cause I knew within a few weeks, I'm like, this is bad. I got to get, I got to get out of this. But I didn't to a point like where unconsciously I allowed it to kind of be like my world Mm. and I was drowning every single day. So for people that are, cause I think I want to, I don't want to pass over that, um, without asking a little bit more because I think a lot of people do that. Yeah. Um, you know, they allow this awful relationship to just keep it's like it's like they can't break away from it right Right. you know it's not good for you um was there anything that you could have done you feel like to maybe that would have preemptively gotten you out of that or something that you'd recommend other people oh i mean a hundred percent i mean all of this is really about living consciously okay Mm -hmm. being awake you know experiencing an awakening where you say holy smokes like i cannot believe i would ever make a decision like that you know i cannot believe I would ever get behind the wheel of a car after drinking again. I can't believe I would put people in danger. I can't believe I would sacrifice everything that I've worked so hard to build. What a selfish thing. In the moment, you're not thinking of any of that because you're so unconscious. And Mm. the quickest way you can dilute your mental vibration is to drink. And that's back to what I was saying before. Like when I found out I could turn off my anxiety, Mm. turn off my depression, sleep well just by doing this, I'm like, holy smokes, I'm going to do this all the time. Why wouldn't I? Well, because it causes chaos. And a year ago today, like it was another unconscious situation. Like I had allowed my life on a personal side to spiral so much out of control to the point where instead of facing it every single day, instead of getting up and saying, how do I get out of this? I went back to the old weight. I know how I can stop the thinking. It's just like this. Sure. Put a bandaid on a gushing. Right. But here's the thing. When when I say stop the thinking, I mean stop all thinking. Mm -hmm. So everybody wanted to say, how could you do that? Why would you do that? I don't know, man. Like I wasn't thinking at all. Like I just remember I wanted to get home. Well, I like what you said is it's get back to having conscious thinking. That's, that's right. all, that, that's what all of this is about. 100%. Um, I was talking to my grandfather today and I talked to my parents yesterday. Like I stay super connected to my family. And if there's one thing I've taken away from this last year, it's just to be able to live more consciously mm-hmm. every single day, you know, do the right thing. Just, I, I say to myself, do the next right thing every day. Just do the next right thing. You know, so you don't have to overthink it. Just do the next right thing, you know. But I was just so unconscious. And, and I look back and I'm like, how would I ever do that? It makes zero sense. I don't get it at all. But I have tools now that I didn't have before as a result of going through Circle Lodge, you mm-hmm. know, and I was in, inpatient for 50 days. And I had to go to jail. And Jimmy, if you don't remember anything I ever say to you, just remember this. <laughs> Don't go to jail, bro. <laughs> don't want to go to jail. It is not the spot, man. Give us an example of just maybe your work, one, a really bad day when you were in jail. Give the audience, because I think it is, it's one thing for people here all the time, you don't want to go to jail, but yeah. like, you got like one example of just like, man, this was like a day in jail. Well, I mean, look, it's not supposed to be comfortable, right. okay? Um, so, <laughs> you're on this metal slab um, with... A little sheet. It's not really a blanket. And then they give you an, an, another little sheet and say, well, if you want to try and use this as a pillow, give it a whirl. Like, it's freezing. It's loud all the time. Like, even at night when you're supposed to be sleeping, they're piping in really hot air, then really cold air. You're hearing the doors slam. You're hearing other inmates yell, yell at each other. Um, you're hearing, like, the gates unlock and then lock. It's so loud. And But the open, the, the eye-opener to the jail experience is your first meal. 
Mm. When you see the food, you're like, oh, <laughs> this is what we're doing? Okay. <laughs> this is going to be a bad time. <laughs> and, um, but look, here, here's the real sad part about it, though, um, is you, the, the majority of the people that I came, uh, I came in contact with while incarcerated are, are good people that mm. just can't get out of their own way. Like my celly, and again, I don't want to oversell it. It was a week. It wasn't a year. Got it. Um, they called him Russia because he looked like Drago from Rocky IV. Mm-hmm. He was about 6'4", about 230, tattoos ever. A big white supremacist guy. His real name was Harley. Um, about 28 years old. And I remember the first time, you know, they, they threw me in there. And, um, you know, that gate locks. And I'm standing across from this dude. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> if he was in a bad mood one day, like he's bashing my head in like, you know... I'm not a small dude, but I'm not a big dude. Yeah. Like this is a big, big cat. And so for the first day or so, like I didn't say much to him. And then we started talking a little bit. And I remember I was, I was just sitting there on my bed. I think you could tell I was losing. My, I was just losing it. Cause I'm sitting there I'm like, I can't believe I'm back in jail. This is crazy. And he said to me, this is the first thing he said to me. He said, Hey, do you want some coffee? I'm like, Oh my gosh, you have coffee. I was so like taken back. Um, and he's, he's like, yeah, man, I got some instant coffee. Now, this is not beans and brews. This is not Starbucks, okay? This is instant coffee in jail. And he goes over. The sink is connected to the toilet, which is right next to your bed. Like, right. if you want to go to the bathroom, you're doing it in front of your cellmate. And, like, this is your existence. So he goes over to the sink and, you know, it's a little lukewarm water and mixes up his ground coffee. And he gave it to me. And, and I almost cried. Like, it was so kind. I'm like, you know, this 28-year-old, like, badass white supremacist, you know, just out of the goodness of his heart, just gave me this cup of coffee. Like, it's not good, obviously, but the, the sentiment, right? right. The act was right. like so kind. So we started talking. He's been arrested 28 times since he was 18 years old. So in a decade, he's had 18 arrests. And he's resigned to the fact that he'll get out on paper. And sobriety to a lot of guys in there, by the way, is only using alcohol and weed. It's mm. sobriety is like, okay, no cocaine, no heroin, no meth, just weed and booze. You know, and, and he was kind of resigned to the fact that he'd get out, hook up with his old friends, probably get arrested again, come back into jail. But I remember he said to me, he said, I want to be better. He said, but I don't know how. And I went, man, that is so sad. Because 75% of people that are incarcerated are arrested at some point in their life. They go back to jail. Hmm. And 85% of people incarcerated are in jail because of a crime committed while under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Like, it's an epidemic, man, in this country. But it's I, a crazy stat. Yeah, you know, and it's sad, it. yeah. you know. Um, but you don't really sleep. Um, you know, I, would, I read um, A Time to Kill mm-hmm. two and a half times because it was the only book I'd get my hands on. Like, that's all you do is you, you just read, you choke this food down, you try and just stay alive. That's just, thanks for sure. That's such a, you know, an interesting story, I think, for people that have never, I, I think sometimes we tr- you know we project what we think is happening in somebody's life yeah. like you said whether it's good or bad and we think we know somebody and we think we know why they react to things the way they do but i think it's important to truly try to understand before we respond to people or situations right it's so easy where you were in the public spotlight mm-hmm. um, i mean that was a really public event right that yeah. was a very public arrest and things like that and so i can only imagine the extra amount of stress. And I mean, you, you know, you have so many things you, you, like you said, you're close to your dad and you can tell, you know, in your podcast interview that you guys have a special relationship. I can only imagine the, you know, the disappointment you have as well. But so being in the public spotlight, was it, did it provide an, or I mean, was that an extra level of stress on you or an extra level of disappointment in yourself? You know, it's, um, it's easy to sit here and say no. Right. But that's, that's not being honest. That's not being authentic. Like, of course you're bummed out, especially when you have a child, when, you know, you, you come home um, because, you know, I got arrested, I bailed out the next day, and then I went to work. I bailed out of jail and I went in, I did the big show, the Rockets were in town, I did mm-hmm. pre-aff and post, and then I called my bosses and I said, look, just so you know, I got arrested last night, I was up front, I was honest, um, and my hope was the mugshot wouldn't get out because there are actually laws in place that are supposed to protect um, it's, it's supposed to protect people from mugshots getting out. So my hope was we could avoid the public thing. Mm-hmm. I wasn't all that confident that we'd be able to, but I was hopeful. Then the next day, my phone rings and it's Aaron Falk from the Tribune. And I went, okay, here we go. Because, you know, the Tribune, the Desert News, the TV stations, they have interns that are watching the dockets to see if a public name will come up. 
I'm, I don't think that's cool, but it's business, right? Sure. Because they're in the they're business of clicks, ratings. right? Yeah. And that's it's not a personal thing with Aaron. Um, so when I got the phone call, I went, okay, you know. And then that night, I'm sitting in my house alone, and there's the news, and there I am as the lead story. And there's my mugshot, and I go, oh my gosh. So mostly, I, I was worried for my son. You know, I was mm-hmm. afraid like kids at school or whatever, like hear what they would say to him. For me, it's easy because <clears throat> I can turn my phone off. You know, I don't have to go on social media. Like to this day, I don't know what people were saying about me. Mm-hmm. I can, I have a guess um, during the time of the arrest because I didn't look on Twitter. I shut down Instagram. Like all of my socials, I just shut down. I reactivated Facebook recently because of the podcast, but I didn't have it for a while. So I, I ignored it, but I'm not going to say it didn't affect me because of course it affects you when, you, when you're in the business of having opinions every day. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those opinions, you have to take people to task for things that they have done that, that, that aren't awesome. Um, if that's going to be your business, then when the, when the shoe's on the other foot and the situation's flipped around, you can't say, leave me alone. My business was, was formulating opinions and sometimes scathing opinions about mistakes other people make. So when it's my turn, there's no way I can say, no, 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 you know. I'm my, off limits. Right. That, that's, that's not how this works, man. Yeah. Um, but I, I will say this. For all the people out there that were really mad at me, and a lot of people were really mad at me, man, and I think there are some people that really still are, there are so many people that have been so supportive throughout this entire thing. Yeah. So, Well, I think that's one of the benefits you get, too, though, of always being honest with other people, right? right? Is mm-hmm. you know, And I think everybody has their shit. We sure. all do. Mm-hmm. And it's like some of us get caught doing things, some of us don't, some of us recover, some of us don't, some of us do these different things. So I think for me, again, the power of your story is how you came out of such a disappointing moment in your life and to, you know, have those relationships where you do and you're now engaged. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got your podcast is going awesome. And so I guess for me, what would you, what advice would you give? That's what I kind of wanted to end with is kind of somebody that maybe is numbing their Mm -hmm. conscious behavior, right? Like how do you reach out to somebody right now and talk to them? What what advice would you give them to help them so that they can get through whatever it is that's causing them to drown their current emotions? Well, it's, it's not an easy process. And I think people have to understand like if, and it, it depends, you know, what kind of spot you're in and it's different for everybody. For me, I needed some serious time away. Like there was no way I could just take a couple of months off of life and then jump back into it. Like I needed a long time to wake up, just to truly be conscious, you know, and just every single day be able to understand exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and see a path, you know, and and walk along a path that is just more awake, mm-hmm. you know, but that takes some time. And the, the further you're in when it comes to numbing, when it comes to alcohol or drugs, where every day is just autopilot and a lot of people are on autopilot every single day, then the closer you are to a situation that could be problematic, whether you get in trouble with the law, where you get in trouble with your family or get in trouble at work, because what, what alcohol and drug abuse does to people is you lose jobs, you lose families, you lose your freedom, you lose your homes, you lose financial flexibility. And then it is a bear to try and rebuild it. That's the problem. So before it gets too deep and Almost, my advice would be almost more to friends and family of people that are struggling yeah. because the people that are struggling, if they listen to this podcast, hopefully they would hear it and say, okay, I got to wake up. Chances are they're going to need a bigger wake up call. What you don't want to have is a wake up call like I did where you have handcuffs on or you're in a jail cell or you lose your job or you have to sell your home or you have relationships change. Like my world changed entirely. Like I have different relationships. I live in a different place. You know, I'm doing everything in my life is different, thankfully, because now I'm a more conscious person and I'm happier every single day, but you don't want to go through what I had to go through to get there. So I would say like, if you have, if one of your buddies or one of your brothers or sisters or your mom or your dad, if you know that they're in too deep with some of the stuff, get a hold of them, like pick up the phone, go to their house and say, look, Let's figure this out because you can get out of it, but it does, it does take work. Secretly, did you want somebody to do that to you when you were in that moment? Absolutely. That's a great question. And that's the cruel irony of all of this because I remember when I got pulled over, there was actually part of me that went, thank God. Thank God. Because I, I had known for about, for about four or five months, I remember thinking to myself, I got to find a way out of this. Hmm. Like I remember thinking to myself, I'm almost in as deep as I was in my mid-20s like we talked about. So what do I do to get out of this? I remember thinking like, okay, I'll figure it out, you know. I'll just figure it out. But 
I was so unconscious that my decision process, decision making pro- process, and this is hard for people to comprehend that has never had issues with drugs, drugs or alcohol. They simply say, "Well, don't you know? Don't drink or drive, or don't say mean things, or don't act like an asshole. Like just don't do that." And in my mind, I'm like, "Well, yeah, obviously, don't do any of that, of course." But when your decision making gets so diluted and so clouded because you are so accustomed to turning things off, you just stop thinking. You know, so it's, it's just about more of a conscious choice of living every single day in the present moment, trying to just, again, do the next right thing. But no, that's a really good question because there were plenty of times where I thought to myself, and here's, here's the crazy thing. You think to yourself, like, I got to figure this out. You know, what am I going to do mm. while you're pouring another drink? Mm. While you're drinking another drink, you're like, man, I really, I hate this. That's the other crazy thing. Most people that smoke hate cigarettes. Most people that are really knee deep into drugs, they'll be taking their pills and they'll hate their pills. And most alcoholics, as they're pouring their next drink and drinking their next drink, they are cursing the drink they're drinking. Mm. You want to find a way out. And that's why I would say to people that no other people that are in that spot, get a hold of them as soon as you can before the consequences are too, too much. Well, and I think most people aren't going to reach out. And so you kind of have to take the liberty of being the good friend or family member in that moment and just really going and doing what you can. Right. Well, dude, your story's powerful. Thank you again. Where can people find your podcast? It's, it's, if you're a basketball fan, by the way, like it is a must listen. You're getting access to stories that I literally felt like I was in a room. I didn't, but like, like how, you know, like I snuck in and, and was hearing stories that I, it was just amazing stories. It, is, it really is a great podcast. Where can people go to, to find that? So my social channels, that's the easiest place. Just, and I make it easy. It's at Spence Check. It's on both Twitter and Instagram. I have Facebook too. Um, and it's, you can just search, uh, reality check with Spence check. It's on iTunes, Google play, like wherever you get shows, like wherever we're on every single, and here's something you probably know that I didn't podcast listeners are snobs, bro. Like <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's on iTunes. And then you get all these, you know, all these people on social, like, well, is it on this? Is it on? so for sure now it's everywhere. Um, anywhere you get shows, uh, we're, we're there. So on my social channels or you can just Google search it. Awesome. Well, thanks again, man. Thanks, Appreciate man. Appreciate it. Good to meet you. Thanks Alrighty. for coming by.